thank you for joining us this evening as we start our Advent series. We're going to be meeting for the next three weeks. Uh, we normally meet bi-weekly, but over Christmas we're going to meet every week. So thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you, Marcia, for reading the text for us. Uh, you'll have noticed that we're calling this Advent series, This is War. And maybe that seems strange to you, but the reason we did it is because it speaks to two present realities that we have. First, it speaks to the reality of the chaos and the disruptiveness of our world. There's a conflict going on. There is conflict all around us. But it also speaks to the idea that Christmas is not simply about the birth of a safe, comfortable, easygoing baby. No, it's about the birth of God become man, become like us in order to free us from this conflict around us. And in fact, he has already won the battle. And so this Advent, we look back on what he has done in order to be able to look forward together. We take comfort in him. And actually, that's all we need to do. We need to come to him and trust him. And so... This is war. And actually, the title is drawn from a song of the same name by a guy called Dustin Kendrew. And we're going to sort of let that guide us through our Christmas reflections over the next several weeks. We're going to take a verse for each week. And so this week we're taking verse, verse one, and it says this, This is war like you ain't seen. This winter's long, it's cold and mean. With downcast hearts we stood condemned, but the tide turns now at Bethlehem. And I want to take three ideas from that. We're going to look at it in scripture together in Genesis 3 that Marsha read for us. Uh, but the first idea is this. There's conflict. There's a war going on. It's not just material or physical, but spiritual as well. As well. And it involves us, you and I. We stood condemned, it says. What's happening in this war? And thirdly, there's hope. The tide turns at Bethlehem. And so we're going to look at Genesis 3 together. Genesis 3 lays out the nature of this conflict. We see who the, the, the parties who are involved in this are. First, there's conflict between God and humankind. In verse 11, God says to Adam and Eve in the garden, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? They had they had disobeyed him. There's conflict there. And as we see in verse 24, he ends up casting them out of the garden. There's conflict in that very special, intimate relationship between Adam and Eve and God. But there's also conflict between God and the serpent. In verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. Between God and humankind, between God and the serpent, between the woman and the serpent as well. In the second half of God's curse upon the serpent, in verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. But there's also conflict between humans. Adam and Eve blame each other when God confronts them. And God says to Eve that her desire shall be contrary to her husband, and he shall rule over her. In that most intimate of human relationships, there's now conflict. And lastly, there's conflict between the human race and the natural order over which we were designed to reign. God says to Adam in verse 17, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. There is great conflict, and the root of that conflict is that disobedience that we saw in verse 11. Adam and Eve chose not to obey God. They disobeyed because they thought that they could attain something better than what God had already given to them through that disobedience, and they believed the serpent rather than what God had said to them. We have a word for that. It's called sin. It's called sin. And verse 15 almost makes it sound like we might be able to save ourselves. When God says there's going to be conflict, enmity between the offspring of the woman and of, and of the offspring of the serpent, and the woman's offspring will crush his head. Almost makes it sound like we might save ourselves. But Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 2, no, we're dead in our sins. We're unable to do anything to get ourselves out of this curse. Paul says in Romans 6 again that we're slaves 
to sin. We rebelled. We sought to depose God as the human race, and there's no way back. In this war, we're exiles. That's what happens to Adam and Eve. They're cast out of the garden, cast out of God's presence. We're exiles. We're refugees living under the dark shadow of death not in control of our own fate, and we long for peace. Do you long for peace? We long for a better country. We need to be ransomed, freed from slavery, redeemed from the marketplace of sin. And so with downcast hearts, as the song said, we stood condemned. But this is not the end of the story. Even in the curse, there is hope. Come back with me for a second to that verse 15. There's a prophecy there. God says to the woman, I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the woman's offspring and the serpent's offspring. And he, the woman's offspring, will crush not the the offspring of the serpent's head, but the serpent himself. His head will be crushed and the serpent will bruise the offspring's heel. There is hope. Who is that offspring? Jump over with me for just a second to Isaiah chapter 7. And the the prophet Isaiah writes, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The virgin will conceive. There's a miraculous birth somehow in in the woman's genealogy. And his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. But jump forward just a second to Isaiah chapter 9. And the Isaiah prophet, the prophet Isaiah writes again, prophesies again these well-known words. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. There's that child again. That miraculous child. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Not only will he be born of a virgin, the offspring of Eve as well, but he will have the name Mighty God, Everlasting Father. What's going on here? Isaiah continues, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The offspring of Eve, who will be the offspring of Abraham, who will be of the tribe of Judah, will sit on David's throne. He's going to be a king in the line of David as well. And yet he's not just God with us, he's God is one of us called Almighty God, Everlasting Father. Who is this offspring? Come back with me for a second to Genesis 3, verse 15. You'll notice that the, 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 the victory over the serpent comes at the expense of his own well-being. His heel will be bruised by the serpent. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, and verse 13, that Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming of curse for us. You see, the reality is that the serpent is destined for defeat. His head will be crushed. He's already crushed, even for us as we look back. And it is in the bruising of the sun's heel that the serpent's head is crushed. It is by Christ's seeming defeat at the cross that his victory over evil is secured. What an incredible picture. There is hope. And the tide turns at Bethlehem. Where will this happen and when? At Bethlehem. Micah, the prophet Micah, in chapter 5 and verse 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, Epaphratha, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And the Israelites knew that that was true. Matthew, in his in chapter 2 of his gospel, says that when the wise men came to see Herod, and Herod got nervous about, who is this king? And he gathered the scribes and the religious leaders to himself and said, where will this Messiah, the Christ, be born? And they said, in Bethlehem, quoting from the prophet Micah. The Old Testament, God in the Old Testament is very specific about who 
a son of Adam, a son of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, a son of David, whose name is Emmanuel, a mighty God, everlasting father. He's very specific about who, and he's specific about where, but he's not as specific about when. And that's where we get to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes again, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. He became a curse, so that we might be freed from the curse. Born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In the fullness of time, God sent him at just the right time. And we happen to know when that time was because the Gospels record it for us. And he was born to fight what Tolkien calls the long defeat, the inevitability of death. We all face death, but none of us were born for it. And we all sense that there's something wrong about death. But Jesus was born to die. That's what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 2 and verse 14. Jesus shared in our flesh and blood so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. The serpent will be crushed. We will be redeemed. And it begins. The tide turns in Bethlehem. What should we take away from this? Friend, if you're watching and, 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 and you are interested in the things of Jesus, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, maybe not yet, you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus, but you sense that something's not right in this world, that there's chaos, there's disruption, especially in this, this past year. You sense that there's something more than what you can see, hear, feel, and touch in this world. An Advent, the time leading up to Christmas as we look back, speaks to that, that longing for redemption, for something more, for a Savior who would deliver us from our sins. Can I encourage you to reflect on that in this Christmas season, to dig into who Jesus is. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. If you have that sense of longing, that sense of there must be something more, Jesus can satisfy that. Christian, as we look back to Jesus' birth, we see that God very precisely, faithfully kept his word in the past, and he'll continue to do so in the future. There's a concept in the Old Testament called Ebenezer. It comes from 1 Samuel 7 and verse 12. And it's this idea that, that God has been the stone of our help up until now, and so we can continue to trust him in the future. And that's one of the things that we look back on Jesus' birth. In the fullness of time, Jesus came and God kept his word, and he's going to keep on keeping his word as well. He's faithful. You can trust him. His timing's perfect. Maybe today you're thinking, when is this, when's the vaccine going to come? just the right time? When's this thing in my life going to come? When, Lord, when are you going to change this? He's good. He's faithful. He'll keep his word. And he'll change it at just the right time. In the meantime, he works in you. That's what he did with Jesus. He didn't just magically make sin disappear. No, no, no. He sent Jesus down into the midst of it with us, one of us, and he does that now. That's to come back to that, that passage in Galatians 4, 4. It says, we have, been, we have been bought back from the marketplace of sin. And because we are now free, we've been given the spirit of Jesus in us. He's with you. He's in you by his spirit. And he walks with you through those. His answer to pain and suffering in this world is to give you himself. Trust him. He's worth it.